Pip here and you are with me on board Medallia, which is my foiling a mocha that I will be racing in the Vendée 2024. about this boat is this incredible four deck area. Um, it just makes sail handling a lot easier for me. Um, it's a, a huge flat surface. We've got really nice tow rails across the center of it and also um, on the side deck. Um, my J3 can come up and down, um, but I leave it up most of the time. The J2 here, this is my structural stay, so this one's always up. And then all of my other sails I uh, set forward of the J2. Um, I've got uh, a J1.5, which flies from the stem, said, stem, stem head. This is a bit of a kind of development sail for us. We're, we're not quite sure what it's gonna look like for the Vendée, but I like the idea of having four sails up and for me that's probably a better option if i can okay there's less drag if i leave them up but changing a sail takes me about an hour and a lot of energy so actually just furling them in and out as i need them is is a good option so we're we're learning about that and playing around with it this year um on the end of the bowsprit that's where we fly our our jennicas our fractional zero j zero masthead zero um when i take the sails down all the control lines are in the cockpit so what i need to do is turn the boat downwind and then i actually use the keel to roll the boat slightly to windward and that means that when i'm letting the um the sail off the halyard lock if it rolls to windward it will roll onto the windward side of the deck i kind of ease a little bit so it falls into the j2 and then I'll put the boat upright again and it all kind of collects down on the side deck. And that way I can make sure, because obviously I'm 40, 50 foot away back there as I'm using the halyard. That way I make sure it all lands on the deck and it doesn't land in the water. Um, and then after that, it's a question of wrestling it into the bag, which is really, really hard. Um, I'm actually thinking I'm going to ask um, uh, my sailmaker whether uh, they've got an old one that I can have in my garden and practice putting into a bag uh, every now and again in the rain probably because uh, they're really hard to bend and they've got a life of their own and when you're on a platform that's moving at 20 knots through the water it can be quite challenging. Um, just going to show you around the cockpit. Big thing about the cockpit is that it is completely enclosed so when I've got huge amounts of water coming over the deck I can just pull this all the way back and underneath I've got great vision of the sails up here but it means I can operate all of my lines uh, and winches from undercover and I don't have to wear a dry top all of the time so this single pedestal in the middle drives all four winches and I can pretty much do everything from inside the cockpit other than changing sails on the foredeck. I still need to go up to the foredeck and actually physically take sails up and down out of the air. And then the only other thing I need to do is when I reef, I need to go forwards and change the Cunningham up the reefing positions. So just leave the cockpit for that. But everything else, all the trimming, all the foil adjustment, I can do from these winches in here. Um, most of the time when I'm kind of scudding along there's a lot of water comes over the deck and the boat's bouncing around a lot so it's quite important that I've got handholds everywhere so you see up here loads of lines to hang on to and these grab handles here and kind of when I'm moving around the cockpit I'm really thinking hard about where I'm going to go where I'm going to put my feet and just never let go because it's so easy to fall. <laughs> okay, I am in my chair now, 
Uh, I spend a lot of time in this chair when I'm sailing. Good view of all the instruments here. And I have a tablet that I pop here that has my pilot controls on it. So I can j literally just kind of move the boat up and down using the tablet. Um, and I've got a great view of the sails. And if I'm really feeling super lazy, I can actually just kind of lean down and ease the main sheet from this as well, um, which is the, the lazy sailor's answer. Um, the other thing kind of of interest really in the cockpit is down here. Um, this scoop is for the hydro generator. Um, and they're internal. Um, so the scoops go down, there are big tubes inside the boat um, and rather than having the kind of traditional outboard leg that sits off the back of the boat, um, we've got the hydrogens inside. I need to be doing over 15 knots for these to work um, and then when I get up to 20 knots I have to start regulating them which is why this bar here is threaded. Um, so I will gently start pulling the scoop up so that less water goes through so that I can regulate the amount of power that the hydrogen is producing. We're now in the main kind of living and working accommodation of the boat. Um, so throughout the boat there are five watertight bulkheads. Um, so each there's there's each section of the boat can be isolated in case of damage. Um, and this part here is where everything is um, other than the foil cases so this is where i live this is where i work all the instrumentation is here um, i guess it's home um, i'm standing at the moment on um, the water maker so that's under this step here that's one of the changes we made over the winter so when we got the boat the batteries were right there and quite often when when we're going really fast and the bow digs in, you end up with about two tons of water on the deck, which rolls down the deck. And then if the boat decelerates, it comes back into the cockpit. And in the time that I've had the boat, uh, twice now, it's kind of breached this main hatch and just dumped down. And it seemed crazy to us that the batteries would be in such a vulnerable position. So during the refit, we built a battery box just to the starboard side of the engine down there and instead we moved the water makers to here the water makers were in the back of the boat where you couldn't access them and couldn't see what was going on so they're now just underneath the step where i'm standing the engine is just in the center here underneath that cover uh all super lightweight the you know the cover's carbon and obviously we've just got fabric on the top here just to keep it lightweight does make it very noisy um, but I can live with that um, these two tunnels all of the lines come down the mast through the cathedral here and then go out through the tunnels so that I've got access in the cockpit and behind here is the keel head so down, down there is like a hole in the bottom of the boat the keel head comes up and then my hydraulic ram is on this side here which camps the keel from side to side and then on the opposite side I have a safety ram which would allow me to lock the keel into the middle should the hydraulics fail. Um, moving over this way, uh, water ballast, I've got uh, two tons of water ballast under this area here and that fills through a scoop on one side or the other and then it can change size in this transfer valve here. Um, I've also got aft water ballast but that gets filled up on deck and it's all completely external that's just under a ton. Um, I use this one when I'm tight reaching or going upwind and here we have the nav station the nav station uh, swings from side to side um, 
so I can always be navigating from the high side of the boat. Uh, and on here, I've got battery monitor, um, keel controls. Um, this is my sleep timer, which is just like an egg timer on a very loud alarm. Um, my PC, I run my navigation software, so I'm running both Adrena and Expedition. I have my um, pilot overlays on there, so I have a PC-based program that drives my autopilot, uh, and then all of my comm stuff comes through the PC. And then I've just got a um, a B&G graphic display, so that when I'm down below or sleeping, I can look at the, the relevant bits of data. Um, I sit at a beanbag, um, on a beanbag, I kind of mould a beanbag into the right shape to work on this. And when I'm sleeping, I normally put the beanbag in this area here and I'll just kind of sleep, effectively just sleep on the floor like that. PC's just there, the alarm's just there and I'll sleep for about 20 minutes at a time. Um, the kitchen and see my kitchen it's there it's impressive isn't it um, but what we did what we did add um, which I think is quite luxurious is an electric tap uh, so I can um, I don't think there's any water in the water tank but uh, it's a new thing for me I don't have to I don't have to use a pump anymore I can just kind of Press the switch, oh, there's no water in there. Press the switch and fire water straight into the jet boil. Um, I eat freeze dried food. Um, it's just easy and convenient. And, and I've found quite a few brands and recipes that I really like. Um, I top it up with uh, lots of dried fruit and nuts. I don't eat any um, sugar, refined sugar, when I'm at sea because I really struggle with the kind of spikes in energy um, so it's all natural sugars freeze dried food and a lot of tea we're now in the section uh, forward of the main living accommodation and this these ones here they're watertight doors here I tend to leave open so that I've got easy access when I'm sailing there's nothing up here because we don't want weight up here so these sails are just here for storage and then there's some foam under there which helps us to meet the rule for the amount of, of um, buoyancy that we need in the boat. Um, and the main thing really in here are the foil cases. So my foils retract inside these cases and meet in the middle here. When we pull them out we've got a uh, four to one purchase that kind of pulls it out in this way uh, and then a single line that pulls it back in again and then this here is the hydraulic ram that rakes the foils uh, and there's a manual pump on that and I can rake them up to five degrees forwards. The reason for raking the foils is it lifts the bow up and um, I play with it a reasonable amount um, because it makes a significant significant difference to the amount of water that's coming over the bow so if there's a lot of water coming over the bow when I'm starting to go at 20 knots and catching up the waves then to stop the bow from digging into the next wave you need to lift it up so I'll rake the foils and then you'll get to a point where kind of conditions are a bit wild and the bow's a bit too much in the air and then you need to back it off but it's definitely something that I've needed to learn to trim in the same way that you, you trim a sail. Um, we are going to have new foils in 2023, so we're going to go for big foils in 2023, and that's going to require quite a lot of modification to this area of the boat. One of the main things is that the new foils are gonna be further forwards, so we're gonna cut out these cases here, and move them forwards in the boat. And that means that the fore hatch just here is also gonna have to move forwards as well because the new foil case will be directly over the top of it. It's a little bit of a scary thought because this is a really nice boat. <laughs> and why would you cut it in half? Um, but um, 
definitely new boards are the way ahead. We're working with um, Jean Verdier and we're going to have the same foils as Kevin Escoffier on PRB, so he's doing our road testing for us, which I think is quite cool. Um, and we reckon that, well, Guillaume reckons that with the new foils, this hull will be up to um, within 5% of the performance of a 2024 generation boat, which I think is phenomenal because, you know, we've got all of these older boats and you don't want them to be obsolete. You want them to keep having life in the race. And so to be able to make a development like that and keep this boat relevant within the fleet, I think is, is great for so many reasons. Uh, I have um, uh, available to me uh, eight sails to race with. So we've got the main sail, uh, the J2, which is my structural jib. So the J2 is permanently up and the stay is permanently attached. I then have a J3 or a stay sail, which gets put up and down as I need it, but I tend to leave the J3 up most of the time because that provides a support to the mid section of the mast to stop the mast from pumping as well. And then on top of that, I've got another four sails that I'm allowed to use. So they're all sails that would be forward of the um, forward of the J2, uh, flown off the bowsprit. At the moment, I have quite a choice. Um, so I've got a masthead zero, which is um, it's a furling sail, uh, a laminate sail, and that's for lighter airs in downwind VMG conditions. I have an A2, which is a soft sail in a snuffer, and that's for light airs, downwind VMG. I have a J0, which flies from the masthead, um, and that's for reaching and downwind in heavy airs. And then I have a fractional zero as well. When I'm not using those sails, the sails that I'm not using have to be put in the right place on the boat to generate speed and performance which means that I have to drag them around the boat and stack them. And that is probably the aspect that I find the most difficult on this boat, because I mean, you can see the size of these sails anyway. It, it's not even, you know, somebody said to me, it's like a body bag. Well, it's not, it's, it, it, it's, it's much, much bigger than that. Um, yeah, they're big, they're cumbersome. When they're, when they're heavy, they weigh about 100 kilos. And I have to drag these around the deck and then actually kind of physically pick them up and put them on top of each other so that they're in a dense little stack of weight. Um, and I, I'm finding that physically quite demanding. It takes me sort of between 30 and 40 minutes. If I want to maneuver or tack, it would take me between 30 and 40 minutes to, to move all the sails from side to side. So um, one of the things we're looking at as a team is how we can modify the boat to make it easier for me to move these sails around um, and get them in the right place without exhausting myself. And in the last race, I tacked early for the front that came across. Um, and actually, if you looked at all of the routing, if you took the human being out of it, then yes, you, 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 you should have gone a lot further south than I did or about 20 miles further south than I did and then tacked at the most aggressive point that the front change you know you get the, the wind going from this to this and I didn't I tacked early and the reason I tacked early was because when you tack on a front like that um, you've got a cross sea so you have no time the, the, the breeze just changes like that and then all of a sudden you're stacking uphill, not downhill. And you've got a cross sea state as well, which makes it even harder. And I knew that, I know from experience, that I've, I find that very physically demanding and the boat's not efficient for about two, it takes me about two hours to sort the boat out after that. So I decided to tack earlier in lighter breeze. And for me, that was the right decision because I had an hour of light breeze and I sorted the whole boat out. I changed sails, I moved everything, I got it all in the right place. So when the breeze came in, bam, I was off. And I think, you know, it's very difficult to break from the pack. It's very difficult to do something different to everyone else. But we're all individual human beings. And that's the whole thing about this fleet. We're all different. Every single person is different. The boats are different. The people are different. We have different experience, different attributes. 
and you have to play to you, your strengths, your boat, and and be, I guess, brave enough and confident enough to to kind of to make your own decisions. Mm-hmm.